Okay, so I'm going to talk about dimensionality reduction. Uh, this is based on several joint works with the people I've written over here. The starting point for what I'm going to talk about is something called the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma. Um, I'm calling it the metric Johnson Linden Strauss lemma because I want to differentiate it from a related thing on the next slide. And what this says is if you have a lot of high dimensional points, okay, then you can map them down to low dimension. So if you have n points, you can map them down to log n dimension such that all the distances are roughly the same as what they used to be. Okay? So there are lots of examples of problems where, uh, like algorithmic problems, where you're given data that's very high dimensional. We'll see some examples. And you can speed them up by first pre-processing the data using this lemma. So there's an, you, know, you can make this lemma an algorithm to actually do the, the mapping and then run your algorithms on the lower dimensional input. Okay, so for example, uh, nearest neighbor search in high dimensions, um, linear, some linear algebra problems, regression, PCA, we're gonna see some of that later. Compressed sensing, we've heard about in this conference, is related to this, and there are several applications. And <clears throat> the thing that I wanna differentiate the metric JL lemma from is a related thing that I call the distributional JL lemma which says that for any epsilon and delta, there's a distribution over matrices, pi, with very few rows, okay? So the, the number of rows of pi only depend on epsilon and delta. They don't depend on the original dimension. Such that with high probability, with probability one minus delta, pi preserves the norm of any vector u. Okay, so this, this thing inside the probability is just saying that pi is preserving the norm of u, the Euclidean norm. Okay, so why is this related to the metric JL lemma on the last slide? Basically, you, <clears throat> you imagine U being the difference vector between two of the original input vectors on the last slide. So you have these n points in space, call them x1 up to xn. Imagine U is xi minus xj, normalized. Okay? So if you preserve xi minus xj, it means you're preserving the distance between xi and xj. And if you set delta to be uh, smaller than the, to the number, total, one over the total number of distances, then by a union bound, you're preserving all the distances. Okay, so this one over epsilon squared log one over delta becomes one over epsilon squared log n, which is what you saw on the last slide. In particular, the, the map from metric JL is just this linear map. You map the vector x to pi x. And there are some theorems that show that this, these, these theorems are either optimal or nearly optimal. So for metric JL, um, we know by a theorem of Noga alone that you can't improve the target dimension by more than log one over epsilon. Uh, and if the map has to be a linear map, then we know that you can't improve it at all. This is something I did with Casper Green Larson, not in 2003, last year. I guess I forgot to change the year. I just uh, copied something. Okay. Um, and for distributional JL, we know actually that this, this lemma is tight. You can't do better than what I wrote there. Okay. Right. So I'm saying that there is this mapping which can map to low dimensions for you and preserve distances. And how do you actually, how do you actually uh, instantiate this as an algorithm? What is the linear map? So the original proof of J and L, Johnson and Linden Strauss, pi was a uh, projection onto a random subspace, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, randomly rotate the vectors and then project onto the first m coordinate. So that's the same thing. And then there were other works later that said actually pi can have uh, independent entries, okay, which, are, which is easier to implement. So, for example, independent signs. Pi can just have independent signs as entries. So pi doesn't even look at the data. Pi is just a random matrix that doesn't look at the data and it preserves the data with high probability, no matter what the data is. Okay, so thinking from the algorithmic standpoint, I'm an algorithmist. There are two phases here, right? Like where would I apply these pies? I said if I have some high dimensional problem, I wanna map it to low dimension so that my algorithm then runs faster, right? So there are two steps. One is apply pi, and then step two is run my algorithm on the output after I applied pi, because now it's lower dimensional. So if I minimize m, the target dimension, step two becomes fast, right? Because I'm running my algorithm on low dimension. 
But there's still step one. I have to actually apply pi to my input. Right? And the downside of these constructions is that to actually map the data to lower dimension, that's dense matrix vector multiplication. Because right? these are dense matrices. Pi is a random dense matrix. And I'm using u0 to mean support size of u. Okay? So just naively using for loops, that's the time to apply pi to, my, to, a, to a single vector u. So as an algorithmist, you know, or as algorithmists, what we try to do is come up with faster algorithms or more efficient algorithms. And there's been work on that. So uh, the first work that got any asymptotic benefit was this one that I'm citing by uh, Ilona and Chazelle in 2006. So his pi was the product of three matrices, which he called P, H, and D, because it was in his PhD thesis. Um, so pi is equal to this product, P, H, D. And the linear map that he did for JL was he mapped U to PHDU, OK? And I wrote down a little bit about what these matrices are. Uh, the point is D is, a, D is a diagonal matrix, so you can apply it in linear time. H is the Fourier matrix, so you can apply it. Um, well, you, why did I call Fourier H instead of F other than him wanting a PhD? Well, I guess he, he, maybe he wrote it as Hadamard matrix in his uh, paper, to, just to make sure it's H, OK? Um, Anyway, H is, say, the Fourier matrix, which also works. You can apply that in n log n time. n is the original dimension of the vector using the fast Fourier transform. And then P is a sparse matrix. It's super sparse, so you can apply it fast, OK? And I'll give a little intuition about why they did this. I'm not going to give you any details. The basic idea is as follows. Take my vector u, right? What is DJL? I'm working with distributional JL right now. I want to make sure pi preserves the norm of u with high probability, right? Forget about the high probability. Let's just say I want to get the right expectation for the squared norm. If I sample coordinates from u, then the sample is going to have, is, is, that's an unbiased estimator of the squared norm, right, if I scale it properly, OK? So imagine just using a sampling matrix as pi. OK, that's correct in expectation. But the problem is that the variance is really bad, because u might have all its mass in, say, one coordinate. So if your sample doesn't see that one coordinate, you're not preserving the norm, right? And you would need to sample n coordinates in the worst case to see that mass in one location. So that's not a good scheme, right? Because we're trying to minimize the number of samples, which means minimize the target dimension. So what this PhD U stuff is saying is HD, you should think of HD as one thing and P as the other. So what HD does is it's some randomized matrix, right, because D is random where for any u, whether u is uh, concentrated or well spread out, it doesn't matter. For any u, hdu will be well spread out with high probability. Okay. And then sampling works. Okay. So p is like the sampling. So that's, that was the intuition behind their, their construction. And it's related to this you know, uncertainty principle like that you hear about in physics. right? Basically, the point is uh, if u is somehow uh, very well concentrated, then its Fourier transform will be very well spread out, right? Uh, so then you want to apply H. And the D, the D is there to make sure that you don't do the opposite, that you don't uh, take very well spread out signals and then collapse them before you sample. But anyway, there have been some improvements uh, to the analyses and some s different constructions since then, but these have a downside, right? The downside of these is that it's slow to embed sparse vectors. If U is sparse, Think about the intuition I said, right? HD randomly smushes around the mass so that sampling works. If your input is sparse, you want an algorithm that has running time, which is really fast. The speed of your, of your algorithm should depend on the sparsity of the input, not on the dimension. Okay? So I don't like algorithms that take sparse data. And there, we've seen in this conference there are many times when you have sparse high dimensional data. I don't want to take sparse data and smush it all around because that slows down my algorithm. Then I have to work on this high dimensional dense vector. Okay? This is great for dense inputs, but it's not good for sparse inputs, for sparse data. Okay. So this talk is primarily going to be about how to deal well with sparse data, how to get this dimensionality reduction even if you have sparse data. And the way we're going to go about it, oh, but before I say that, is you know, where do sparse vectors show up? You've already seen it in this conference, but let me just do two of these.
So the first one, like user ratings. I believe Encore at some point gave a talk on uh, matrix completion, where he talked about the Netflix matrix having you know, roughly 1% of its entries filled in. So the point is you have a matrix. So you actually think of you as a matrix now, uh, where you, so, user, so there are rows are users and columns are movies or products for some other company. And UIJ is uh, how that person rated that product. And most people haven't rated everything, so this thing is mostly empty. Right? This is a very sparse input. The first one, for example, documents as bags of words. This is something that people do in information retrieval, machine learning. Um, so you have some document. A document could be an email. It could be a web page. Okay? And you treat that document as a high dimensional vector. Okay, first of all, why? You, what you want to be able to do is compare documents to each other. Right? So for example, I have an email and I want to compare it to some other uh, document to test whether or not my email looks like a spam email. Right? Or I'm a search engine and someone does a query and I have to show you results. I don't want to show web pages that are very similar to each other because people mirror things, right? People, once one website is out, someone else might mirror it at another URL. I don't want to show you duplicate results. So I want to filter things, documents, or, or websites that look very similar. So there are many applications where people need to do some document similarity comparisons. And what do they do? They treat a document as a high dimensional vector where the dimension is the size of my dictionary. Okay. And then UI, the ith entry of U is the number of occurrences of word I in the document, maybe weighted by the importance of that word. And then I want to be able to do some comparison between these things. So for example, cosine similarity. I look at the cosine of the angle between documents, which by the way is preserved by, if you preserve L2 distances, you preserve cosines of angles. Okay, uh, just take my word for that. It follows by parallelogram rule. Okay, so sparse vectors appear a lot, especially in machine learning applications. Okay, so that's why I care about them. And I said that I want a pi, I want a dimensionality reducing map which can process sparse inputs quickly. Well, one way to embed sparse vectors faster, or even any vectors faster, is to use sparse matrices. Pi, this dim dimensionality reducing map, pi, should be sparse. Okay, if I can make that sparse, that's good for me. So in particular, if pi has the property that it has at most s non-zero entries per column, then I can multiply pi times u in s times the support size of u time just using for loops. Okay, so the name of the game now is I want s to be small and I also want m to be small. m is the target dimension, s is the sparsity, which for me is the proxy for running time. I want them both to be small. So the original JL proof um, got m to be something like this. Okay, remember I want to preserve norms up to 1 plus epsilon with probability 1 minus delta. And Ocliopta showed that you can achieve um, m, you can keep m the same even up to the constant factor, but improve s by a factor of three, which means you can apply pi three times faster. Um, and there was some sequence of results afterward, and eventually Daniel Kane and myself, actually at the time, I think, yeah, at the time he was a grad student here at Harvard um, in the math department, uh, we showed that you can keep m the same up to a constant factor, but s improves by a factor of epsilon. Okay, so you can actually get an asymptotic improvement in the sparsity of pi by so you get you're faster by a factor of one over epsilon. Questions? I see some. You can interrupt me with questions. I don't mind. You don't have to wait till the end. You don't even have to raise your hand. Just yell. Okay. So another thing. I'll say is that later on with uh, Hui Nguyen, we showed that even if you allow m to be any poly 1 over epsilon times log the number of points, now this is metric jail, you have capital N points, um, s has to be roughly what Daniel and I got, up to a log 1 over epsilon. Okay, so it's optimal up to that. And if you don't care about your dependence on the failure probability that much, if you're, if you're willing to have a polynomial dependence on the failure probability in the target dimension, you can even get s to be 1, that's even older. Okay. And what does pi look like? What does our pi look like? It's something very simple. We show that either of these two pi's work. Okay. Well, let, me write, let me draw it in matrix notation. Either of these pi's work. So the first one is like the simplest thing you can imagine, which is 
The columns of pi are independent of each other, OK? And within each column, I pick exactly s locations without replacement, and I put random signs there. Okay? So it's a, it's a very sparse sign matrix, random sign matrix. So all those black cells are plus minus ones, and then everything else is zero. Another thing you could do, which also works with the same bounds we showed, is just divide up the rows into blocks, you know, deterministically, the first m over s rows, the next m over s rows, et cetera. And in each block, put a random sign in just one location and zeros everywhere else. Okay. So these are the pies. And one open problem <coughs> um, is, well, actually, I'm just going to skip this open problem. Okay. Analysis. Why, how do we show the pi works? I'm not going to get too technical on this analysis. The whole analysis is just going to be this slide. Uh, I'm not going to actually really do any calculations. Really, so the way that we go about things is this pi matrix that I defined for you a slide or two ago, what do entries of the pi matrix look like? Okay. There's a delta which is either 0 or 1. Delta ij just tells me whether or not that entry is 0, zero or non-zero. So it's, it's a 0, 1 random variable. Sigma ij is a plus minus 1. It's a random sign. And there's a normalization but 1 over root s. So it's a random sign over root s times a 0, 1 random variable. Using this notation, you can expand out the L2 norm squared of pi u. Okay? And remember now, u has unit norm. I want to preserve this unit norm vector. So the error is pi u L2 norm squared minus 1. That's the error. So the error is this. Okay? And the only thing to note is that the error is a quadratic form in sigma. Okay? And the matrix looks something like this. You can write down what the matrix is. And then what we do is we just use known tail bounds for uh, quadratic forms. Okay? So there's something called the hansen wright inequality, which tells you that if you look at that quadratic form and you can bound its operator norm and its Frobenius norm, that will tell you how the tail of this uh, error random variable decays. So we bound those things, and then that gives us exactly what I told you. So that's all I want to say. OK. It's not too, it's pretty simple. OK, so what next? OK, so what have I done so far? I told you that if you have an arbitrary set of n vectors, um, there's a somewhat sparse matrix that you can use uh, to embed them into lower dimension to then process them. Somewhat spar sparser by a factor of epsilon than the naive thing or than, the straight, than what was known before. <clears throat> okay, what next? Okay, so there have been some talks on uh, random matrices in this conference, and I'm going to show you uh, something about that. Okay, so what is, uh, and some applications. Okay, so what did I just tell you? <clears throat> this is sparse JL, okay? What we showed was if you have U an arbitrary vector, of unit norm, and pi a sparse sign matrix as the one I showed you, then with high probability, uh, you'll preserve the norm of u, OK? As long as m is at least log 1 over delta over epsilon squared, and s is a factor of epsilon better. And I really skimmed over this, but if you remember the analysis I told you, we really did this tail bound here, this hansen right inequality. It's a bound on the moments of this quadratic form. And what we did is we did Markov's inequality on some really large moment, OK? And then that's what, that's what ends up giving you the actual final result that I stated. So which moment do you take? So if you take the log 1 over delta, delta moment, you get the theorem that I told you. You get failure probability delta. Or you could do thorpe jong and take the second moment and get away with s being 1, but m blows up exponentially. OK, so uh, <clears throat> let me just rewrite this uh, in a way that's meaningless right now, but won't be meaningless on the next slide. Okay, what is a vector? A vector is just this vector u that I'm preserving. What is a vector? A vector is just an n by 1 matrix with orthonormal columns, OK, a uh, unit vector. OK, the ortho doesn't mean anything because there's only one column, but uh, <laughs> it'll mean something on the next slide. <clears throat> 
And I'm just rewriting the L2 norm squared of pi u as pi u transpose pi u. And one is the one by one identity matrix. And I'm, uh, I'm making sure that it's basically pi u transpose pi u is close to its expectation in operator norm with high probability. Okay. And what I conjecture to be true is that a lot of these ones, because you, you have one column, can be replaced by uh, Ds. Okay? This is a conjecture. Take an n by d matrix with orthonormal columns and pi the same sparse JL transform I showed you a few slides ago. Um, and you'll preserve, you'll have this kind of preservation guarantee uh, as long as m is at least d over epsilon squared and s is like log d over epsilon. Okay. And I'll tell you in a second why this is important. But I'll say until then that uh, what Hui, Gwyn, and I were able to prove is we were able to prove this conjecture up to some log factors. Okay. And actually recently there's been some improvements by uh, Michael Cohen, who's a grad student at MIT. Um, so with him, I think there's only one log factor that's left now. The conjecture is still open, but we're closer. Okay. So some remarks. Uh, this d squared, this bottom bound here, which follows by taking the second moment, the first who, uh, who got close to it up to some polylogs was Clarkson and Woodruff, uh, and then uh, Hui Nguyen and I showed that actually, yeah, there's a much simpler proof of it, and there are some others who also got it at the same time. And <coughs> just like just like in the d equals one case with the Hansen right inequality, we use the moment method. What does the moment method mean for matrices, right? Basically, we do Markov on the elf moment, and then we use the fact that the operator norm of the L is at most the trace of the lth power of the matrix, and this is a very standard thing that people do in random matrices. Okay. Um, and one thing I want to say is, um, maybe I'll come, I should have put that on the next slide. So, I'll come back to the next thing I want to say and just say this. Who cares about this matrix extension? Okay. Why did I make this generalization at all? And there's actually very strong motivation for this. So to say that this operator norm is at most epsilon is the same thing as saying it's equivalent. Okay. This is linear algebra. It's equivalent to saying that pi preserves the norm of x for all x in a certain subspace. Namely, the subspace spanned by the columns of u. So think of the columns of U as an orthonormal basis for some d-dimensional subspace. This is the same thing. And subspace embeddings, it, turned out, it turns out, as I'm going to show you an example of, can be used to speed up algorithms for many numerical linear algebra problems. So if any of you were here for David Woodruff's talk, I think on the, the, the last talk of the first day, he talked about robust PCA. And somewhere in that algorithm, he was using subspace embeddings to do robust PCA. Okay? Least squares regression regular PCA, k-means clustering, SVMs. A lot, there are a lot of algorithms that have large matrices as input, okay? And you can speed up algorithms by using subspace embeddings. And I'm going to show you an example of that very soon for like least squares regression because to show you is, very, is a very simple, it's a very simple reason why, um, why subspace embeddings can, can show up in, in faster algorithms for those problems. And, <laughs> The thing that I should have put on this slide, I just want this note on the bottom, right? So in some fields, like Wigner, right? When Wigner was looking at random matrices in statistical mechanics, the random matrices were there to model data, right? Or to model some phenomenon. For us, our data is not random. For us, the data can be worst case, okay? I'm an algorithmist. You give me some computational problem you want me to solve, and I'm supposed to come up with algorithms that solve them quickly. It's not that the data is random, it's that this I'm using random matrices as a tool to get faster algorithms. Okay. My data is not random. Just it's a randomized algorithm to solve this worst case problem. Okay. And you're going to see an example of how to use the algorithm. Okay. And the nice thing about sparse pi is that you can multiply pi times a and time, which is s, the sparsity of pi, the column sparsity of pi, times the number of non-zero entries in the matrix a. Okay. So let's go to numerical linear algebra. So let's say I have A, which is a very tall and skinny matrix of rank R, n by D. So look at, let's look at some classical numerical linear algebra problems, computing leverage scores of A. Um, 
<coughs> this has some applications in some optimization algorithms. Um, uh, least squares regression, okay, so this is a classical statistics problem. Uh, given, given A and B, find an X which minimizes the L2 norm of AX minus B. Low rank approximation, given a matrix A, find a low rank matrix B which is close to it under some norm. Here I put Frobenius norm. Uh, find a good preconditioner for the column space of a matrix A, et cetera. Okay, I can put a bunch of problems here. Okay. Turns out all these problems that I wrote down, um, if you don't care about running time, you can solve them all using, let's say, the singular de uh, value decomposition of A. Okay, so theorem, every matrix A has something called an SVD, singular value decomposition, which is a product U sigma V transpose, where sigma has the singular values on the diagonal, okay, and U and V have orthonormal columns. And I wrote ND to the omega minus one, maybe that's more of theoretical interest. Let's say you can compute the SVD in N times D squared time. Okay. Okay. And for me, I'm thinking of N as huge. Okay. N is the number of users in, uh, on Amazon or something. Okay. N is some big thing. I don't want to do ND squared. I want to go faster. Okay. And just to go back to some of the problems, once you have the SVD, you can basically read off solutions to all the problems that I wrote before. Least squares regression, low rank approximation under Frobenius norm, et cetera. Okay. And that says that in SVD time, I can compute an answer to all the previously stated problems. Okay. Omega is the exponent of matrix multiplication. Think of it as three. Okay. How long does it take you to multiply two D by D matrices? D to the omega time. That's what omega means. I want to go faster. Okay. And I'm going to show you a very, like, a very simple example of how to go faster using subspace embeddings. Okay. So let's look at one of the problems, least squares regression. Let pi be an epsilon subspace embedding for the subspace spanned by B and the columns of A. A has D columns, B is one more vector. This is at most a D plus one dimensional subspace. Okay. I don't expect you to have remembered all the bounds I'd written before, but I can preserve D dimensional subspace with pi only having roughly D rows. So pi has roughly D rows. Okay. And how am I going to solve this least squares regression problem? I'm not going to minimize the norm of AX minus B, which takes me N times D squared time. Instead, I'm gonna minimize the norm of pi AX minus pi B. Pi A is not an N by D matrix, pi A is a D by D matrix, right? So I can do that in, instead of N times D squared time, I can do that in D cubed time. Think of D as much smaller than N. Why does this work, okay? The reason it works is basically a one-liner, okay? So if X tilde is the minimizer for the lower dimensional problem, then for the lower dimensional problem, X tilde does better than X star does, right? X tilde is the minimizer for the low dimensional problem. But what's this, what's this vector right here? This vector right here is just pi times a certain vector. And this vector lives in that subspace, spanned by the columns of A as well as B, right? Therefore, pi preserves it. That's what a subspace embedding does. Similarly, pi preserves that vector. And if I just rearrange things, I get that the cost of using x tilde for my regression problem is at most a one plus epsilon over one minus epsilon factor times the cost of the original regression problem. Okay. So rather than solving an n by d regression problem, I solved the d by d one, and I did basically almost as well. Okay. So I can do this in you know, for least squares regression, I guess you, would, you don't need, actually need to compute the SVD, right? It's like A transpose A inverse A transpose B is the optimal solution to least squares regression. So instead of doing A transpose A, I need to compute pi A transpose pi A. But pi A is a much smaller matrix. Okay. Um, I should also note that there are some things, there, there are more efficient ways to use subspace embeddings even for least squares regression. I just explained the simplest way. Okay. So for example, there are things you might not like about this. If you remember the bounds for subspace embeddings, the number of rows of pi isn't really d, it's d over epsilon squared, right? So if I want to get really, really close, oops, if I want to get really, really close right here, then I should set epsilon to be something really small, but I'm paying as one over epsilon squared, which is not great, right? Um, so, but there are other ways of using pi. So for example, this is mentioned in a paper of Clarkson and Woodruff, one thing you can do is actually set epsilon 
don't get a, don't get an epsilon subspace embedding, but get a, like a one half subspace embedding, okay? So really now you only have O of D rows in pi, not D over epsilon squared. You have only O of D rows in pi, and then you can use that pi to then find a good preconditioner of A. So basically you, you compute pi A, you take the SVD of pi A, and you can read off a good preconditioner for A from that SVD, and then you can um, do iterative algorithms like conjugate gradient or catch marts or whatever you want to do, gradient descent. Okay, so there, and at the end of the day, your dependence on epsilon and, the, and your algorithm will be log one over epsilon instead of one over epsilon squared. So I don't want to get into these, um, basically I just showed you the one-liner way of using some space embeddings, but there are more sophisticated ways which get even better performance, okay? And there are ways of using subspace embeddings for PCA, k-means, et cetera, et cetera, robust PCA. I'm not gonna get into all that here. Okay, uh, back to the analysis. Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Forget about the analysis. Okay, so, um, so good. So I started off with finite point sets. That was the Johnson and Strauss lemma. Then I moved on to sub preserving subspaces. That's useful in high, you know, large linear algebra problems. Okay, what else? What else can I do, or what else do I care about? So let's just, let's just, you know, take it to uh, arbitrary point sets, okay? So not, not necessarily finite. So let T be just an arbitrary set of vectors, okay? Um, and what I want is I want a pi that preserves the norms of all vectors in T. So in, in JL, U, these vectors U were like difference vectors between my input data. In linear algebra, these U's were coming from a d-dimensional subspace. But for now, let's say I just have an arbitrary set of points T. T could even be infinite. Subspaces are infinite, right? Okay, good. So if I normalize all the vectors in T, to have unit norm, this is the same, this thing, whoops, uh, this thing over here, to say that for all t that happens, is the same thing as saying the soup over all u and t of this deviation is at most epsilon. And if pi is a random matrix, let's say I want that to happen, I, I want that the expectation over pi of the soup to be small. You could also say maybe I want high probability, okay, not just expectation. Yeah, you can, the things I'm gonna say can give you that too, okay? So this is the thing I want at the bottom. We talked about finite T, right? T is just uh, normalized difference vectors. We talked about subspaces, okay? Um, <coughs> and here are, some, here are some problems where uh, subspace embeddings that I mentioned can be applied. There are other kinds of T's that people care about that I haven't told you about yet. Or maybe I said it on the second slide in a bullet. Um, but one is, for example, compressed sensing. Compressed sensing, what T do they care about? In compressed sensing, what they want out of pi is they want pi to preserve all vectors u that, have, that are k-sparse. Okay, remember that's the support size. I want to preserve the norms of all k-sparse vectors. That's a union of n choose k subspaces, right? All the coordinate subspaces. And a pi that preserves this T has a name in the literature. It's called having the restricted isometry property, or RIP. And it's known that um, if you have a, a matrix pi which satisfies this RIP, then given pi u, you can recover u approximately in polynomial time. Okay? If u is approximately k-sparse, and you have a 2k RIP matrix, you can almost recover u from pi u. Okay? This is compressed, this is uh, compressed, one of the um, core compressed sensing results that are known. People also care about supporting many fewer than n choose k sparsity patterns in model-based compressed sensing. So I think Piotr Indyk mentioned this earlier today when he was talking about graph sparsity or tree sparsity, okay? That's just another T that people care about, okay? It's just another T. Another T people care about. There's something called manifold learning, okay? I don't have much time, I'm not gonna get into manifold learning, but it's, a, it's something that people use for classification, okay? Um, so for example, so let's say handwritten digits. So <coughs> the idea here in those works is, so I have an image, like an image of a handwritten 
drawing of some number, like the number two. And I want to be able to know, I want to train an algorithm to know, to recognize that this is the number two versus another number or versus something that's not a number at all. And the observation of those works is that actually, even though this is a high dimensional vector, treat, you know, there are many pixels, each pixel is a dimension, even though it's a high dimensional vector, all valid drawings of the number two that humans would recognize lie close to a low dimensional manifold in this really high dimensional space. Okay? And now what manifold learning is, is learning that manifold so that I could then classify two. Okay? And this paper by Brian Ugin Walken suggests reducing dimensionality using pi and then learning in the lower dimensional space. And for example, one thing you might want to do on the manifold is preserve curve lengths. So to preserve curve lengths, what you should do is you should preserve this T, which is an infinite union of subspaces, namely the tangent space of the manifold. The manifold okay? So that's another thing that you might want to care about, and people have actually analyzed this kind of thing. I'll do one more, which is constrained least squares. So let's say that I want to minimize, I want to compute the argument over x in a, some closed convex set of this thing. So one example of that is something called lasso, which is very popular in statistics, where your constraint set is the L1 ball of some radius. Okay. And it, if you solve lasso, it encourages x star to be sparse. And one thing you could imagine doing is instead, just like I did before, minimize this lower dimensional problem. And Polanchi and Wainwright showed that if you, want, if you want this to be a good solution, basically there's another T. Okay? There's another T. If you preserve that T, you'll get a good solution to this constrained least squares problem. Okay? Don't, you don't, don't worry too much about what the T is. I wrote it down. All that matters is there's another T. Okay, so can we do better than the JL lemma using linear maps? Um, okay, I'm really running out of time, so let me, I'll take one minute. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Casper Green Larson and I showed that there is a T, right, where you can't do better than the JL lemma. The JL lemma really is tight for linear maps. But if you really look at what this is saying, this is like a worst case result. It says that for any, basically for any N, there exists a hard set of vectors T where the JL lemma is tight. Okay? But I don't care about arbitrary worst case hard sets of vectors. I might only care about subspaces, or I might only care about tangent spaces of manifolds, et cetera. There are specific T's I care about for my application. So this kind of you know, optimality results doesn't mean anything for those applications. So you might want something that's beyond worst case analysis. And there's a theorem by Gordon which says that, for JL anyway, where you have finite, set point, finite point sets, that log, t, that log the size of the number of, that log number of points can be replaced by some geometric parameter of the number of points. So if your points are nice, you don't actually need log n dimensions from JL. You need the square of the Gaussian mean width of the point set for JL. Okay. Um, so this is something which is more instance wise, it's an instance wise bound as opposed to a worst case bound like JL. And it's always better than JL. Like it's never worse than JL, I should say. Okay. But it has the same problem that his matrix was a random Gaussian matrix, or you can think of a random sign matrix, pi is dense. So <clears throat> let me just say, <coughs> question, can we obtain a Gordon kind of theorem to understand how to set M and S as a function of T? Right? I don't want worst case results for sparse JL. I want a result for sparse JL which tells me that how things behave as a function of the geometry of the point set T. What if T is a subspace? What if T is something else, et cetera? And what we're able to show, this is joint work with, actually it should be 15, uh, Jean Bourguin and uh, Sher Dirksen, is we can get things for various t's by some meta theorem. Uh, and the meta theorem says something like this, let t be an arbitrary point set, with, with unit, which is normalized to have unit norm. And <clears throat> as long as some magical function we define is small, then you'll get the JL guarantee and you'll preserve everything in t. Notice that this magical function depends on S and M. So as long as you set S and M to make this thing small enough, then you'll get some good guarantee. And also M has to still be at least the square Gaussian mean width as in Gordon's theorem. And I promise I only have this slide and one more left. Okay, so I just want to say something about what does our theorem really mean. So Gordon's theorem, right, there's this G of T, which is the Gaussian mean width, 
where g is a Gaussian, and you look at this expression, the expectation over g of this soup of g dot x, and you define that to be g of t, okay? Gordon's theorem says if you take a random dense matrix like a Gaussian matrix, it's enough to have g squared rows. What we're saying is if you want to use a sparse matrix, you still need g squared rows, but you should also consider this thing, which I call g eta of t. g eta of t is the Gaussian mean width where you only keep certain coordinates in the vector x. Eta is like a 0, 1 vector, which zeroes out certain coordinates. And what I care about is that um, basically if you take a random eta, then g eta of t should still be small with high probability. Okay, if you take a random eta and g eta of t is still small with high probability, then you can get away with sparse matrices. And that's basically what uh, Borgain, Dirksen, and myself showed. Okay, so this is what I'm saying, that g eta of t is small with high probability. And what's one way to show that g eta of t is small with high probability? Using the moment method, you need to say that uh, the qth moment of g eta of t is small, okay, to get tail bounds. And this is, this is basically what that is, okay? It's, um, it's basically the qth moment of g eta, okay? So I know that was maybe a little technical, but the bottom line is we can get some kind of meta theorem which you can plug in t's and it'll tell you how to set parameters as a function of t um, to preserve things even with sparse matrices. Okay. And qualitatively, up to log n factors, for example, we can recover previous bounds for subspaces, for unions of subspaces, it's manifolds, et cetera, et cetera, sometimes even improving the bounds. And um, I am done, so let me just leave it on my last slide with some references and skip everything else. Okay, good. So open problem, I just wanna reiterate this subspace embedding conjecture I had. Um, and if you want further reading, there are some books. This one is particularly recent, it just came out a year ago. I also have some course notes from my website. Thank you. Oh, um, in manifold learning? Yeah. I don't know if anyone has, I don't know if it's like in, in it's uh, used by any company or something. I think, I think, um, well, first of all, okay, definitely, I think no one's, no one's done any experiments with like sparse JL for manifold learning. Uh, the paper that I mentioned by uh, Baraniuk and his collaborator, I think they might have had experiments in their paper, but I don't know if it's been used in, let's say, a real company. No, um, oh, okay. Um, I, th I think, well, one thing that people have been looking at right now is using subspace embeddings for these large-scale linear algebra problems. So, for example, if I, uh, there's this thing going on at IBM on sub lib Skylar theory, okay. So there's this thingy that, they're, that they've made. Uh, that many of them are at IBM. I think they're collaborating with some other people in academia as well. But they're looking at using subspace embeddings, uh, so like sparse embeddings, also the fast JL transforms, et cetera, for, uh, for large-scale linear algebra problems and machine learning problems. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of this stuff is very new. Like many of, the, many of the things I've cited are since like, say, 2013. So I don't think things have become mainstream yet, but people are, people are at least trying to do something and make it uh, more available. <clears throat> 